So which one? So obviously, so you, you done Washington the first one. Yeah. You did the first of the Shea Stadium ones. So well, where else did you? It was 65. Yeah. I saw then after 64 was big for me. I saw the, the Washington, D.C. concert. Then they were in Atlantic City. And they were, well, we, they were in New York also. So I saw them in New York. We were at the Delmonico. That was two concerts. Then after that, they were at um, Atlantic City's Convention Hall. That was a ruckus. That week, it was, they had the Democratic National Convention there which is all politics and bullshit. Yeah. That stuff didn't appeal to me at all. And the Miss America pageant was wow. there that week and the Beatles, right? <laughs> so what I did was when Mrs. Bollendorf gave me my 16 magazine, it had about where the Beatles were going to play. So that's when, you know, we knew we weren't going to go to Los Angeles. I mean, that was yeah. a little bit out of the question. <laughs> but any of those things... But that was the good thing about like being Philly, Baltimore, Washington, New York City, you know, even Boston's like a five hour drive, but you could do it. You know what I mean? So yes. and they're all places that they, they like to play because those kind of bands always had fans there and all that kind of stuff. So I I I said I remember telling Shelly when I circled the ones I said I was going to. I said, you pick where you want to go. But I'm telling you, I said and. We have to stay in the hotel. That it was a deterrent. If I had known they were going to be at the plaza, I could have made reservations ahead of time. But who knew? They probably didn't even know where they were staying either until no. the last minute. I don't know. I said, but we got to we got to find out. So what I did was this is like, you know, I should work for Interpol. Hello, guys. If you need me, who would expect 75 years old? I'm harmless. But anyway, or Scotland Yard or the FBI or somebody. But my mind just works that way. And I thought, that's right. If I had had a reservation, no matter if I looked like a 15-year-old St. Pauli girl or not, I would have gotten in. I had my ID. You know, I had my passport. I had, you know, I would just, I am supposed to be in there. They would let me go. It just wouldn't have not happened. So they used to have phone companies in beautiful buildings. They don't have them anymore. Well, they have little mall stores that say yeah. T-Mobile and all that crap. But anyway, these were big granite buildings with marble countertops that you paid your bill and all that stuff. And the bills were about five bucks a month. And that was if you made a few long distance calls to California, if you had family. So anyway, I said, here's the, here's the problem and here's how we can fix the problem. She said, what are you talking about? I said, frankly, I think our best bet for a hotel will be in Atlantic city because they're going to be so exhausted. So are the police, the America and Miss America pageant will be gone. The democratic national convention, the Beatles are coming. And I just have a feeling it would be the best place for us to stay. And it's not a big city. And there's the beach right there. Yep. I mean, there's, there's the beach. She said, yeah, but how many hotels are down there? And, and how do you find out? And I said, you go to the phone company. And at the time the phone company had, you could, you could get anybody's number at, at any way at the one that was on Oxford Avenue near my house, they had big racks and they had the local, you know, Philly Yellow Pages, which was business and, and residential stuff. But you could get, you know, if you wanted to talk to somebody in Ottumwa, Iowa, you know, you would look up the Iowa book or whatever it happened to be. And it was available to you. And I said, you know what? We could go get a New Jersey book. I said, or I could ask my, my aunt for one if she has one left because her sister was down there and she had just passed away. I said, we could get one of those books. We need a yellow pages and maybe a white pages. I said, I'm going to go down there and see, see what we can do. Otherwise we're going to be at the phone company and we're going to be writing everything down. So a lady that was very pretty and she was really very nice. 
And I was looking, you know, I didn't have a mom with me or anything. And I was looking through books and she asked me, is there anything I can help you with? And I said, I, I really need, it's a long story. I said, but I really would like to have um, a, a, a New Jersey, you know, business book and uh, a New Jersey residential book. I'm like, are you hearing what I'm saying? So I'm talking to her slow. I'm like, are you hearing me? You know, are you okay? And she said, well, what is it for a school project or something? I thought, hey, I said, well, sort of, yeah. It, it really is for, it is for an important project. Yes. I didn't lie. I didn't say it was school. I said it was an important project. And she said, you know what, hon, let me go in the back because even though the 1964 book, you know, may be exactly like the six, the 1963 book, nothing's changed. We have to print the new edition anyway. And the old books, just, you know, they come pick them up and off they go. She said, let me look in the back and let me see what I have back there for you. So she came back and she gave me a New Jersey yellow pages and a New Jersey white pages. And I said to Shelly, I said, you know what we're going to do? In fact, I don't have that them because I had a lot of things to store when I moved to Germany and we had a lot of, you know, how some happens that things get missing. Yeah. We had a flood unfortunately, but I do have two of them and I'll have to, I'll take a picture of it so you can see it. Um, from 65, I wanted to try it again, but by then Beatlemania was so out of control. Yeah. I'm glad we did it in 64, but I have one from the Americana hotel reservation. I have one from the St. Regis and I asked for my right hand to God. I asked for a park view. Okay. $25 for a park view room. Yes. And I swear to you, and I'll tell you on the 25th anniversary of Beetle, I've got so much shit to tell you on the 25th anniversary of Beetle mania. I had, wow. How long ago was that already? Good night. But I had an old one for the Plaza Hotel for 65. I figured they are never gonna stay unless they do it privately. They're never gonna stay at the Plaza again, but that may be the thing. Somebody's gonna think they're never going there again and they may end up there. So I wrote to the Plaza Hotel and I kept it. And on the, the month before, this is when Donald Trump got the Plaza and his wife, Iv Ivana, was she Ivana? Ivana. Yeah. Ivana, I keep getting the term mixed up with the daughter. She was running the hotel at the time. My right hand to God. I got a letter back from Mrs. Trump because I said, yeah, I took a copy of, you know, what I had done. I was such a Beatle fan, yada, yada. I said, and it's the 25th anniversary. And even though my glance inside the 12th floor suite was brief, I would love to stay there and look through those windows and celebrate the 25th anniversary of the boys being right there when I was right there too. She wrote to me and invited me as a guest. Wow. I, didn't, I swear to God, I didn't pay anything. They had a bottle of champagne in the room. There were chocolates. I was more, you know, I was more drawn to the chocolates. Than <laughs> it's like candy, yay, right? So, and it it was it was a beautiful suite. And I'm I mean, you know, I'm sure they were the same chandeliers because they were just. What would you ever replace? Um, I don't know if all the pieces were Waterford. I doubt that, but they yeah. were beautiful crystal. And, you know, the, the crown molding at the top. And I'm just thinking, wow, the vibes that were here 25 years early. And I got to be there exactly 25 years later. Fabulous. Isn't that it. wonderful? So anyhow, where was I? Oh, back to, back to the lady at the Oxford Street Bell Telephone Office. So she came out with both books. She had them. And they were last year's books. They didn't need them. So anyway, I said, I could really have these. I was so happy. I can't tell you. This is going to make our work so easy, right? So 
she said, have, you know, you, you can have them. I'm very happy that I can help you with your project. And I said, I am very happy to. I said, what's your name? Now, you know how things happen for me. Her name was McGillicuddy. <laughs> <laughs> what are the chances that she, I said, Mrs. McGillicuddy, you have no idea how much I thank you. I just felt like I knew something was going to happen. I got the McGillicuddy magic happening for me again. <laughs> So what we did was because, you know, Summer was, was there. Um, Shell worked at um, Grant's on Frankfurt Avenue. It was like a, she, it, it was a, like a five and dime, you know, we could go in and buy every little thing and, oh, here we go. Every little thing. Very good. Thank you. That's too. I should have known better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. Well, now and then you, you do it. Nah. Now and then. We could do we could do this all night, couldn't we? we I, I'm telling you. So anyway, when I called her, she uh, she would um they put her outside with ice cream and, and um water ice, right? So anyway, when I told her what happened and what we were gonna do, I had no idea. She said, I said, we have to, I can get envelopes from my dad's business. You know, they're he has some plain ones. He wouldn't, he wouldn't miss them. And I could ask him for more if we needed them. I said, it wouldn't be a problem. And so I said, but we're going to need stamps. Stamps then were like six cents. Now they're like 66 cents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ridiculous. So anyway, I said, so here's what we do. Ask your mom if you can come over for the weekend. It took a little while, you know. But anyway, I, my dad had um, a Smith Corona typewriter and... I, I used the typewriter because I had nice handwriting, but um, she had better handwriting than I did. And what we did was it was cut and dry. We went through all of, I mean, there were places called like Harry's Sunset Inn in Atlantic City. I said, Brian, you know, she would say, Do don't, you, want you me don't to need that. I said, Brian, no, is never going to have it at Harry's. He is his, if I will eat that typewriter. Yeah. <laughs> in Harry's. No. So we went through the whole list and between Atlantic City, we had 597 places that they would have been between Philadelphia and and so wow. with just and I didn't want I couldn't do a, well, there was carbon paper back then, you know, it yeah. was just run off stuff. But anyway, I had to personalize everything. But we did it and we managed it, but we couldn't, we didn't have enough. I mean, you know, we mailed no. them every so-and-so. And my dad had one of those accordion pleated files that he kept. Oh, yeah, yeah. Didn't want it because he got a, a regular box like this, like this one. And I said, can I have it? And so when we sent them off and we got our reservations, I said, all I wanted was a twin room for me and my sister who um, we were celebrating a relative's birthday. Okay. Yeah. Aunt and Mary, maybe. Aunt Mary, Aunt Mary. So she was, you know, good old Aunt Mary. So anyway, we did it and the mail would come and, you know, it was summertime, so my mom spent a lot of time with her mom or over at her sister. She trusted me at home. I went to school. I mean, I wasn't in school. I went to work. And, you know, and Carol's mom was cool because we were good students, good kids. They had no idea what was percolating in here, you know, but good for us, right? And they figured our walls were plastered. That was enough. They could just shut the door. They didn't have to look at <laughs> the pictures. So when when things came in, like for Haddon Hall in Atlantic City, I put right in the H file of the accordion thing. And then at one time the Lafayette Motor Inn came in, you know, there were other places. And so when I found out what well, we got into the Delmonico, we did get into the Delmonico and that was really nice, but we got in a lot of trouble at the Delmonico, but it wasn't bad, but they were a little, tighter with their beetle people but the management felt bad for us because every time we tried to get an elevator although we had reservations this is the delmonico i'll get to atlantic city because that's the big wow right 
But when we went to the to the Delmonico, they were tied. The girls were all outside and everything. And we got in because I and I guarded that thing with my life. If anybody saw us, I'd have, I'd have lost it. And I would have said, go in. I have a reservation. They would have just you know sent me packing. So we we got up up there and, and then got booted back. And when it came time for, cause you always found out where they were staying. Cousin Bruce yeah. saw to that, the DJs all saw to that. So when it was, and Atlantic City is not that big. I was born in Atlantic City. I wasn't born in Philly. Right. So I said to, I said to all my girlfriends, I said, this is where the magic happens. And I feel like that again, that Paul Coelho thing, when you really want something, the whole universe, yeah. right? So I said, it's, I was born there. It's, it's got to happen. It's, it's, it's happen. meant to happen. It, it is. So when the Lafayette Motor Inn came in, I thought, like they'll stay at the motor inn, but I didn't realize it was a pretty nice place. It was a motor inns I always thought were like two stories high. And yeah, the motels. Down. You know, yeah, 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 like that. And I thought they wouldn't stay there. But when I saw what the Lafayette looked like and they had a big Eiffel Tower up on the top of it, I wonder what they did with that. If I knew they were tearing it down, I would have had it. But anyway, you know, I would have. Oh, of course. I, I don't doubt anything you say. <laughs> it's so unbelievable, but it's like, you know, I, I know like Frank says, Jude, if somebody's around you, just say for a little while, they're going to get it. And I said, he said, I was around you like 20 minutes. And I thought after he, you know, read the, read the, the book and a couple other things that I'd done because I wanted to do the work for the paper. And he said, yeah, it's there. I, yeah, it's there. So when I found out, I was like, please, God, please, please, please. So I'm waiting to hear where they're going to stay. And it wasn't, cousin Bruce and it wasn't Murray it was high lit from WIBG and he said that the Beatles would be at the Lafayette Motor Inn and I had probably eight or nine that began with L you know what I mean yeah at the Lafayette Motor Inn 109 North Carolina Avenue I was familiar with it because it's on the Monopoly board I knew right where it was right it was right there so I'm like Oh, please, please. And, and my hands are almost trembling because I, I just, I knew it was going to happen. I just freaking yeah. knew it was going to happen. So when I went through it, it was like the next to the last one. And I, I had, I still hadn't given up hope. I'm telling you, I'm going like this because the, the hotel's names were always in that corner, the business envelope, you know. So I'm looking and I'm still, I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. And then I'm like, oh, and it was like, Ah, ah, the smile <laughs> opened up, right? the angel sang it. It was like, bingo, we have a winner, you know, winner, winner, chicken dinner. We were You're in. I couldn't get on the phone fast enough. And by then I had already decided what I was going to wear at the concert, which is like, you know, the colors on the original book, the black and blue. Yeah. Um, turquoise, right? Well, Back then, the skirts weren't many, but they were eh, a little above your knee, but not a lot, you know, and it was summertime. So it was no sleeves, had a little boat neck kind of collar. And they started doing it again. You know, when they color in the size of the dress, a different color. Well, the dress was black and they had these cut ins that were turquoise, which is why I made I never thought anybody would think about Patty hounded me to write that book. Right. So. I just figured 50 people will probably read it. It'll make Pat happy. I'll be having something to look back on and read, you know, and that would probably be it. Who knew? It's not like I yeah. sold a million books, but I, I, if I had sold one book and still ended up in the cavern in the case, it would have been worth selling only one book. You know I've I mean? always said exactly the same thing for me when the Deepool came out. As long as I could see it on the shelf at Waterstones, a legitimate bookshop, I was happy. That was it. I was, that was it for me. And I was down there and um, Glenn Noller went down there with me. And I was honestly, and who, who 
who helped me do that? Oh, isn't that awful? The, all these things I can remember what I ate the morning I saw the Beatles. <laughs> but anyway, he was down there with me and I'm signing books. And I thought, I'm in London. And I'm at a bookstore and I'm signing a date with a big, I'm like, when somebody was like, I heard all about it, but you know, I, I just can't wait to, to read it all by myself. And I'm just like, I was more happy than they were. I said, oh, I hope you really like it. I mean, we were both, everybody's hugging everybody. And it was like, just wonderful. I was just so jazzed. So anyway, but when I, I did, okay, segue back, not staying there long to New York, but my friend that said she had that Ronette look that would have attracted yeah. George and that I should like John because he liked blondes. That wasn't working for me. So anyway, I thought, well, there's nothing going to stop me. I'm not going to ever be a five foot three inch Puerto Rican. It's not going to happen. I'm going to be five feet, eight inches tall with a strong Norwegian background and I'm stuck with it. So I would embrace it. And I learned to, it, beehives aren't as difficult as you think until you start teasing your hair and wrapping it around. I mean, initially, it's just a matter of pulling back and I would never, ever do it again. And two and a <laughs> half, two and a half cans of Aquanet. I mean, really, I'm telling you, you could, you could have shot a bullet through it and it probably would have dropped off before it reached the back side <laughs> of the, up here. I mean, honestly, it's like this high. So I got, I knew I had the beehive down. I bought the funky dress. Gladiator sandals were in. Don't ask me why. You know, the ones that go up to your knees. Oh God. But that they were. And, and that was what I was wearing. But the one thing I had a picture of Estelle Bennett, who George had the hots for. And I did look at her eyes over and over again. There was here. Here's like when I tell you about remembering some things. It's not even there anymore. It was right at the last L stop at Bridge and Pratt. It was a pharmacy called Tancredi's. And they sold Egyptian eyeliner. And, and the guy in the pharmacy said, all, all the girls say, this is the stuff. This is the good stuff. I said, can I run it myself? He said, excuse me. And I said, <laughs> well, you know, you know, be my baby girls and all that. And, and then so he said, well, it'll be a, a little different look on you. I said, forget that I'm blonde. Forget that I'm tall. I said, this would work, right? He said, absolutely, it would work. And so I practiced and practiced. I don't know how I used to they, but they knew me when I came back in because I ran out of eyeliner. I wanted to make sure that I got it right. Yeah. It was like, and they always called me Jude. Little, I mean, that's what happens when you're named Judy. They call you Jude. I always got it way before that. You know, the song. Hey, Jude. Yeah, that, that was it. Like people would see me and they go, hey, Jude, how you doing? I go, hey, how you doing? It was just, that was it. So I walk into Tancredi's and it would be like, hey, Jude, guess what? I know what you want. And I said, can I have two at this time? Can I just, I'm working on it. He said, why don't you come in with it on? Let me. I said, nobody can see it. I'm still working <laughs> on it. Nobody can see it. So anyway, when I was finally sure and it was like, just like this far from us going to Atlantic City. When I was sure, I asked her to come over to the house. I said, stay the weekend. So my room was right at the top of the stairs and I knew how long it would take her. We didn't have phones. She couldn't say, I'm walking up the street, you know? So I knew she'd be here. My, you know, she would knock. My mom would say, come on in. She'd come up the steps. So I heard her and she went, hey, Jude. I'm here. What's up? And I said, wait, just wait a minute. Wait a minute. And the door was closed. I had my outfit on. I had my gladiator sandals. My hair was run at it. And so were my eyes. And I had perfected them. I'm telling you, <laughs> they would have had me be their makeup woman if they could <laughs> see how good my eyes looked. Right. So anyway, I'm just looking at these. Right. Look, look. You, that, what? Perfect. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Nice. There they are. So anyway, when I opened, I opened the door and I was behind it and she came in. <laughs> then I closed the door. And when she looked at me, she went, 
oh my God, your parents are going to kill you. Oh my God. <laughs> where did you, and she's like, where did you get that dress? And goes, you've got, I had hoops, my silver hoops, right? And I said, per, I said, I had them pierced, Priscilla did it at work. Ah, you got holes in your ears. <laughs> she was like, so, so shocked. And she said, the hair, the, I said, do I smell like Aquanet? She said, the whole house smells like Aquanet. So I, I was just, I was so excited. And she loved the gladiator sandals. She said, where'd you get them? You didn't get them down, down downtown. Well, she knew I got them downtown. I didn't get them down in our neighborhood where there were shops. And I said, no, I got them in center city. So anyway, then she said, wait a minute, come here a second. And so I came up closer to her. She said, let me see them. And she looked at my eyes and she said in all sincerities, probably the most least critical thing she ever said to me, but she said, they're perfect. I'm like, yes, that's all I needed to know. So we were all, you know, I had to quick go get in the shower. You have no idea that hair I don't even want to go into it. You have to let the water soak all over it first. You have to pour shampoo on it and hair conditioner. So it was called cream rinse at the time. It wasn't even called air conditioner. But to soften it, yeah, you know, to get the goop going. And then it was three or four other washes followed by a cream rinse after cream rinse. And then at the end, another good, I swear to you, it was just nothing but like glue. It's a wonder my hair didn't snap off. <laughs> Really? So anyway, we had reservations for the Lafayette Motor Inn on North Carolina Avenue. I have loved North Carolina to this day, right? So there's the same situation going on, the same thing. There's the barricades. There was one guy who really from the back looked like he could have been a beetle. He was built a little differently, but he had the gray and he had the Chesterfield thingy going on. And, you know, I looked around sideways just to see if he was chewed. He was okay, but I wasn't interested. It was like, I had my eyes set this way. So I'm looking and I, you know, explain to her, I said, you see these girls explain the barrier thing in New York. I said, they could storm this joint. So anyway, we didn't have to storm the joint because we had suitcases. That's so, yep. So I, I did not look like my Ronette self. That was for sure. I went in and I looked like a very polite and proper schoolgirl from Philadelphia. And that was that. So, of course, we got the hands from the cops, you know, first. And I said, sir, we have reservations. I didn't know they were going to be here or we would have been someplace else. This is not going to make my mother happy, which it wouldn't, but for another reason, yeah. right? Yeah. So he said, all right, come on, let me see. And I showed him. There it is. There it is. And I could almost hear Shell go. <sighs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> oh, oh, thank God. The relief. It was. And and oddly enough, the room we were in, another thing. 403. It's my birthday. <sighs> what is it? You know, oh my God, come on. Right? So anyway, the con I will have to say. But we'll, we'll jump to the concert because that's when stuff really happened. Well, after the concert anyway. But we knew they were on the eighth floor, the top floor. And later on that night coming back, they, I, don't, I think they, they took them to Philadelphia in a fish truck. I don't know what they brought them back. I forget, to the Lafayette. But anyway, the girls had music playing because they were all jazzed from being it. And the cops weren't. You know, they figured they had everybody under control. <laughs> so they had, um, there was a hotel right across the street, shorter, and some of the girls were staying there and they all were tuned to the same radio station. And I'll never forget it. Martha Reeves and the Vandellas dancing in the street was playing. And they used to do line dances in Philly where everybody was doing all the same cool stuff. And I can see that in my head. I'm watching like a hundred girls doing a line dance. And, you know, then the Beatles were, we're yep. watching from upstairs. And so here's another thing I found out. And in the years that passed, it was a shame. Like people just don't understand how things, good things happen to me. They just do. 
And when there wasn't, you know, Larry Kane who wrote a book and talked about what happened and Ed Rudy wasn't really talking about what happened. But when I said that night after we came, you know, back from the concert, I was ready to run it myself. Right. And we heard like when, when we were coming in, because the girls knew, some of them knew we were, and somebody yelled out, they're playing a hard day's night upstairs for them tonight. And I just stopped and I turned around and I went like this because my mind was working already, right? <laughs> and I thought, why would they be playing a hard day's night upstairs right there? And you know, they wrote every little thing when they were at the Lafayette Motor Inn. Right. They did. And so my, my mind's working. So and it takes a while to do the eyes and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And she was a little more sensible, but cool, but cool, I will say. So I'm like, if they're upstairs watching a hard day's night, the lights have to be off. And if the lights are off and we just happen to get off on that floor, or maybe if they're watching the elevator, there's still the fire exit. We could go up and down the fire exit. We knew where everything was by then, you know? So anyway, she said, do you think it'll work? I said, I have to think it'll work. I can't put any negative stuff out there. You've got to, it's a, yes, we'll leave it at that. It's going to work. So anyway, she said, I don't know. I just, I worry about it and all that. And she was such a, I mean, I could understand her. Her dad was a little on the strict side. He worked for a prison. You know what I mean? So right. he was a nice enough guy, but he had, he was a disciplinarian all the way. Nice fellow, but you know, she wouldn't have gotten much leeway. My dad probably would have, you know, probably kept me in for a week and then said, let her go. Yeah. Leave her yeah, go. Let's go. yeah. But anyway, that's what my dad would have done. But anyhow, so we get dressed and we both look nice. And so I knew we were going to go get in to see the movie somehow, some way, or at least get up to that floor. So when we get dressed and we go downstairs scoping things out, Wait to hear this. There are all of these beautiful women in the lobby. And I mean, they weren't dressed, you know, trashy or anything like that. Yeah. They had nice sheath clothes on and, you know, pretty jewelry and their hair was done well. And I'm just, you know, here I am with my beehive and my <laughs> everything. And I'm just looking at them. And some of them had just the little wings, you know, but not Ronnie Bennett eyes, right? Or Estelle Bennett, really. So anyway, when, when we're down there, we're all crowded. And I notice this little guy comes down. He has a striped suit on. He was a really sharp dresser. He looked Italian. And good looking guy. And he came, oh, he, he had some girls in the first time he had about four or five girls in the elevator. And then he came back down again. And then he put another four or five girls in the elevator and said, hold that. And he walked right over toward me. And then, so he said, you know, you look good. You, I, you'll get picked. And I said, well, yeah, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what he was talking about, right? So anyway, Shell's behind me, who is a lot more observant that way. I'm just thinking of the <laughs> romance and stuff going on. So here I am, you know, well, you know, I mean, I wanted to look hot and the kid did. I have to say I did. So anyway, she's behind me and she said, they're hookers. And she could hardly talk. And I thought she said, they're lookers. Lookers. Yeah. So because there's all this noise and everybody's smoking, like, you know, they all, they all smoke. I didn't smoke. And they're all smoking their cigarettes. Some had nice little cigarette holders and all kinds of snazzy stuff. And when she said they're hookers, I, I leaned back and I, I said, because I, I got the hookers, right? And I didn't hear anything. And I said, well, of course, they're lookers. You think they want ugly girls up in that room? And then she leans in real close to me and said, Jude, I didn't say lookers. 
I said, hookers. Then all of a sudden, my eyes scanned the room as I hadn't seen it moments previously. And I'm looking at these girls. I know what they had in other hotels. I know what they were doing on a ripper bob. Come on, you know. And I thought, oh, my God. I was petrified. I was then I was scared because I thought, oh my God, I was still I was a virgin. I every we both were. And in a, in a room full of hookers, and a guy says, You look good, you look nice, you'll get picked. Oh my God. So I just started to run away. And remember, I don't even know if they still have them anymore because nobody really smokes anywhere. But they they were like these big silver um ashtrays. Big yeah. Can, you know, and, and everything. I knocked one over running. I mean, I just like, I didn't, and I look back and I go, Oh God. So what, ha what happened was, yeah, that was really, that was a hot mess. So anyway, we, we ran up, we ran up the steps. This is almost, I'm trying to make things go faster because we've talked so long already, but um, we, we ran up the steps and we had to get into the room and there was a lot of busy stuff going on, but not anything that was that busy. And so I just walked down the hallway and I just opened, you know, just to see if I could, could get in. And then two cops asked what we were doing. And I said, hoping that what I heard outside was true. I said, we're here for the hard days night showing up here this evening i said i didn't think we could make it but we're okay so there really was a hard day's night up at the i mean the show they really actually saw it right there at that hotel yeah. so anyway um what happened after that we were just still trying some doors and people were walking by and the cops just figured we just just didn't feel right to them right you know so anyway they called to us you know what i mean get back yeah. here hey hey you and we're like you know so we ran down to the down on the fire escape got back into 403 and well that she got into 403 before i did and when by the time i got there there were two policemen that were there as usual. And I, I remember the, the one cop saying to me, this, this is, it was really funny. He said to me, your, what was it? Wait a minute. He said, you, you and the other Vandella, right? You know, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. Yes. You and the other Vandella, you know, we had like our, our last stay up there. Right. And then, so anyway, and I said, but we have reservations. And the guy said, well, you had reservations and this hotel has rules and regulations and you broke them. And he was just cut and dry. And I thought, I am never getting away from this guy. You know what I mean? And then, so he said, frankly, I don't care if you are Wilma Flintstone and she is Betty Rubble. And then I just thought I'm going to be a wise ass one more time because I know I'm getting kicked out of here. So after he said, I don't care if you're Wilma and she's Betty Rubble, right? I went, no, what will Fred and Barney say? <laughs> right? Just like, oh God. And then she, <laughs> nail, she nails me right in my back like, shut up. Is there we had enough trouble? So anyway... We had to pack up. We got booted and we were out of the hotel. It was not going to stop me. But we we waited and waited and walked around and walked around. The crowds thinned because girls had to go in 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. There were still some diehards hanging out there, one o'clock, two o'clock. And it was then in, we walked in the back. And I remember when we were talking, I said, I didn't want much. And she says, you always want much. And I said, but in a good way, in a good, <laughs> way, in a good way. I said, I just, I just wanted to have a conversation with him. I, I, I didn't want, she said, you could have called Highlit 
And you could have easily talked him into one of those things where people go backstage and you meet them and then you sign a piece of paper and a picture they have. And then they say goodbye to you. And it's the next yeah. person. I said, but I didn't want that. And she said, oh, that's right, Jude. You didn't want that because you could have been in front of four Beatles. You could have worn anything you wanted. You could have looked wonderful. You would have gotten extra time with George. You know, you would have. And you would have gotten his autograph. You would have gone off on your merry way. We would have been safe and sound. But no, look at the screwed up, which was the worst curse I ever heard. Of, the screwed up mess that we're in now. So I said, I just, I didn't. I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry. And I just felt bad. And I'm looking up thinking, oh. So we walked around the back and then I see a paint truck. And it had a big ladder on it, a nice ladder. So I said, oh God, I said, we could get this ladder. And there's, it was roped. I said, and those ropes, we could, t and she's like, look at me with her mouth open. Like, I can't <laughs> believe that you're saying this to me. And I said, because look at the balconies. Look how the balconies go. They're up there. So either we get up so far and, and knock on a door and ask somebody to let us in, who knows, or if, if something, something will happen, or if we, we can actually get up to the top floor. I said, you know, like how Ringo had his, his, his neck was stolen at the Delmonico when we were up there. I said, it would be something that would make the news happen. And maybe they go, I got to meet these nuts of chicks or whatever it was. I said, something, something good's going to happen. She said, I don't like it when your energy gets up again. I like <laughs> it when you were depressed. I said, but it'll work. Come on, help me. And then I'm pulling the, the she said, no. And, and I said, I always told her, I said, there goes my, my friend with the, you know, her inconsistency, she lack of continuity of purpose. Right. So <laughs> anyway, I got it off and I had the, the ropes and she just was looking at me and she said, I can't do it. I'm so sorry, but I can't, I'm just, I don't want you to, I just can't. And so she just turns around. I don't know what happened to her. She just, she ran away. And I said, there she goes, my friend and her lack of continuity and purpose, right? So anyway, I thought, what have I got to lose? You know, and I, I had heard that some girls were trying to get up in the back, you know, and, and then there's another thing years later when, you know, people didn't have, there were so many things that weren't documented. And then yeah. there was Officer Clifton, who I think in 84, 20 years after I said, you know, after all the, the craziness that I told all my friends, Patty and, and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And I said, it happened. I'm telling you, I was climbing up. I said, it was like, I was good in gym. You know, I was, I was athletic and all the rest of that kind of stuff. I knew I could, could do it. And I remember when um, Shelly was saying, I said, we could make it. We could make it. You just swing from one, one thing to another. You know, you could do that, you know, kind of give you momentum. And she, she said, the worst thing that could happen was, and she, I remember her saying was, we could die. I we could die. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So anyway, I, you know, me and my zippy, the chip moves, but, but 20 years later, officer Clifton, Clifton was asked about, he was Paul McCartney's bodyguard at the time. And he was asked about what was going on. And I hate how he referred because I wasn't there with another girl. There were other girls who obviously had the same idea. Good on them. Right. But anyhow, he said, some girls were climbing up the back of the Lafayette Motor Inn, using ropes and swinging, acting like human flies, which was such a, I'm like, yuck, what an awful visual. You know what, I mean? <laughs> what an awful visual. So I still, well, the, some girls come in the back and I got up further, I guess, than most of the other girls. And somebody said, there's a girl up on the balcony. And I'm like, oh, you know, where could you shut hide up. the balconies? Like, yeah, shut up, please. Balconies, just that little like at moon thing, right? Yeah. So anyway, oh Lord. So the cops come back and they, you know, were yelling at me. 
And then <laughs> the one said, hey, you, right? I said, excuse me, are you talking to me, officer, <laughs> right? He said, listen, wise ass, right? These guys are yelling at me. You get down here. Well, you know, they had, they always have fire trucks because you never, you know, when it, they still do at some concerts, there's like a fire truck and emergency vehicle and yeah. in case somebody, something happens. And, you know, with things being the way they are nowadays, who knows? But anyway, so they had now, if they had taken the hose and fired it at me directly, they already knew they would have blown me off the building, you know, but if they did it here and I was here, you know, on the brickwork pier and I'm over here, I got soaking ring and wet from it hitting and going Shh, like this. But that's all they needed, a quick, you know, squirt. And my yeah. beehive went from, horiz you know, vertical to horizontal. My eye makeup was an absolute mess and I had given up. So I get taken downstairs. I'm right by one of those same lovely sofas where all the hookers were sitting and standing around and all that stuff just a little while earlier. And I never looked worse in my life. And all I wanted him to see was how lovely and beautiful I could be. And that I did this because I knew that he liked it. And, and what I had romanticized everything, but I was 16 then, which was no different than being 15 for me. No. Right? Like it's no different me being 23. So, so <laughs> right. So anyway, I sat down there and this officer that I named Officer Stern. I didn't <laughs> really know what his name was, but in my life only after that, I referred to him that way. So that's the name that I kept right for him. Yeah. He was not happy at all. And I imagine, you know. He had daughters or something at uh, my age, and he thought it was disgusting and disgraceful. And, you know, I'm calling the paddy wagon. And, and he had my information because I had a hotel. Reservation. There. So he said to me, your address is 1120 Wakeling Street. I'm like, oh, God. Then I remembered. Yes, of course it is. I, I had to get the reservation, right? And I said, yes, sir. And the telephone number is, it's when we used to have names, right? Cumberland 89809. Yes, sir. I said, you're, you're not going to call my parents, are you? And then I started going again in Judy mode, right? So I said, because really, it's after three o'clock in the morning. And if you would call my mother at three o'clock in the morning, she is not. He said, Shut, tell me what to do, right? You know, I thought, oh, my God, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm realizing there is water dripping from every place in my body from the, I could look sideways and see my hair here. The beehive is yeah, now gone. here, gone. And when I went like this, I'm like, oh my God, oh no, <laughs> right? I'm just like <laughs> wiping it off me. I'm like, I can only imagine what I look like. And my gladiator sandals, two of them, two were torn on one side and the other. How that ever happened, I don't know. And my, I had black stockings on, of course, with sandals. Who does that, right? And I had turquoise fingernails and like half of them were broken. My had a hole in the middle of my knee, of my stocking. And I'm as white as they get. Do you know what I mean? It's embarrassed. Yeah. And it, it was like, there's black stockings. And like a grapefruit size hole in my knee, it was just this big blast of white, right? So I was just ready to give everything up. I thought, I'm probably going to be grounded for God knows how long. This is just awful. And I, I just, what was I going to do? So anyway, I'm there. He calls. I hear him calling for the wagon. He said, let me get back to you. I got some more information I, I've got to take. I'll, I'll be with you in a minute. So somebody else came over and talked to him and I'm just sitting there and I could really feel I was probably getting the first headache of my life, honestly. So I'm sitting there and I have my head like this and I'm thinking, how are you ever going to get the hell out of this mess? You don't even know where Shelly is. You don't even know where anybody is. No. You're one screw. I mean, I was like, 
Well, you're one screwed up mess. This is ridiculous. You ever think this is going to happen? Oh, yeah. You know, he's going to leave Patty Boyd for you, right? Look at how you <laughs> Patty wouldn't look like this on her worst day. Patty would look better than you when you looked like you were on your best day. She still looked better than you. Right? <laughs> so I'm giving myself all this negative feedback. And I don't, I, again, I can't even explain why. I'm sitting there and there's a puddle in front of me, a little puddle from all the drippings going on from my hair. And I was sticky because of all the hairspray. You know what I mean? Like my, cause it was yeah. a sleeveless thing, the black thing. And I was just like sticky and my face was just, a, you know, <laughs> it was awful. So I'm just thinking awful things. I'm thinking hopeful things. I'm wondering where my friend is. And I'm just kind of like sitting like this. And then I hear a ding and you just automatically look up and like five feet in front of me, whether or not I can't imagine why he would want to come downstairs or if it was one of those situations that has happened to me in the meantime, which I thought could have been an explanation. You know, how, like I've, I've done it on, at Beatles Fest when we've been there. I, I get on and then I push seven and I five, the doors open and there's nobody there. Yeah. And then it was probably somebody pushed it and then went, I'm walking or I got something else to do or whatever. So that's the only other explanation I had for it. But it wasn't the moment. I mean, I had told my friends for ever since December of 63, when I meet him, it's going to be the most beautiful moment. It just is. I just know it is. It's going to be beautiful. So I'm thinking, what a fool you were. Imagine the humiliation. Well, that's what you get. This is what you get. <laughs> so when it opens and the ding and I, it was so surreal. I can't even, it, you know, and then I realized what I look like and I went like this again. You know what I mean? I yeah. just, I wanted him to see me. I wanted to look and see him, but I just looked so awful and everything was wrong. Nails broken, everything hair, but just in a puddle and the cops were coming to get me. Oh God. So anyway, oh, I have my head down like this and I have my hands like this, but I can still see things. Like I can still see yeah. you through these fingers. I had to see him. I just, it, I knew this was probably, this was like God. This was the chance. This was it, sister. So I'm looking. And then he goes and puts a dime in the Coke machine. And I thought maybe he just wanted to try a Coke machine. I don't so know. So was, was George just on his own? Yeah. Yeah, it was just him. Yeah. No, nobody else. So I'm looking. He gets gets the Coke. And, and then, you know, when he like turned around again, I thought, I can't, I can't change my position i gotta look so my eyes are as far following him like this then i see his feet change position and he's walk like my way my way right so i'm looking like this his shoes are this far from the front of my torn up broken sandals he's standing in my hairspray water and <laughs> fire hose H2O at the same time. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't speak. I was just, so he, I put my head up. He had a hanky in his pocket. Who does that anymore? Do you know what I mean? He was so polite. I was such a mess. I never look worse in my whole life. In my whole teenage yeah. life, that was the moment I never looked worse. And I never looked better before it happened. You know, I mean, I look great. So he hands me the hanky and he says, you could probably use this. So I just took it from him and I'm looking up at him. And from those big, goofy old 50s, 60s era lights and stuff, you know how like, 
if the light catches you right in the back, you see all the, halo. the little halo and the front, the little hairs that you think are down, but they're really yeah. not. And just those little things. And I'm looking, he has this glow around his head. <laughs> and I took it and I'm just kind of looking, I'm dabbing it myself and I could just feel the, oh, and some of it like stuck to me. I was just so embarrassed. I was so mortified. So I went to go hand it to him and I'm looking at this beautiful, which probably bought from Savile Row. It was probably the GH on it. it was probably hand done by somebody. So I went, I said, um, I'm awfully, awfully sorry. I could hardly talk. I was so, I can't tell you how embarrassed I was. Oh my God. So he said, just keep it. And he had the Coke and he had opened it because I heard it go because you had to open Cokes that you didn't, you know, I heard it go and the thing. And I just thought he's going to that. My first thought was when I heard that he's going to maybe you know, just wanted to use it. He's going to go now, but I'm going to look as long as I can. And then he walks over to me. And so the cop says, yeah, actually when I, when I was, um, when when they arrested me, the cop said I was being arrested for resisting arrest, which who wouldn't, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. And theft, which I did steal the paint truck and ladder and the rope. And then it was um, destroying private property. That was when the, 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 ashtray yeah. and was dented on the side and then the last one was he said to me solicitation and I said solicitation and I swear to god this is thought if I get anything else wrong I get this right he said to me solicitation and I said solicitation the only thing I ever sold were Girl Scout cookies back in 1955 you know, so yeah. any, anyway, so George said the first thing that I felt more calm, but it was the way he said it. And it was in that you can do it better than I can with the liver puddling and thing. But what he said was, what's all this? You know what I mean? And then so he, he repeated what I just said to you. She is yada, 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 yada. Yeah. And um, so anyway. And then, so he said, thanks to you and your friends and her bad taste in music. That's why I was being arrested. So I, I knew this guy who had been sent home by the cops, which is probably what maybe drew him that way anyway, who was deported, you know, who got arrested on several occasions and did illegal things and stuff it was not sitting well with him and he was in a position now to do something about it. I'm holding this hanky. I'm holding the Coke. And then, so he wanted to know what happened. And he said, I was climbing, you know, swinging on the balcony. <laughs> he said to me, too many Tarzan films. eh?" I thought that was so cute. Was that cute or what? And then, so I told him, I said, I, I like the monkey. I mean, what can I say? You know, I, I, I like the monkey. And I thought you, um, in my head, I'm saying, you like the monkey. I'm like, I, you know, but it was such like a, a real kind of moment, you know? Yeah. It, then I was kind of forgetting, not totally, but forgetting what mess I was and all that kind of stuff. But I thought, he's on my side. He's on my side. So when he said, you know, they were calling the wagon and, and George, you know, said, I mean, he was defending me. And so he called to send the wagon back. And I mean, the, the conversation between us was so short, but it was just so funny and, and cute. And then when, when the cop did say, when he added on to George, when he said solicitation and George looked at me and went, solicitation you know right yeah i said it was only girl scout cookies back in 55 right i'm like oh my god right so anyway then the cop says all right get out 
And you know how many times I heard get out and stay out. So <laughs> yeah. I finished the sentence for him. He said, all right, get out. And I said, I finished it for him. I said, and stay out. So he just looked at me, went about his business. I heard him call for the wagon not to come and all that kind of stuff. And I just, I, I, George started to walk away and he turned around and I said, do you want, and I asked him again about the hanky and he said, keep it. And I said, it, it's soda. You know, I'm like talking like I'm like three years old, one word things now. I'm like, <laughs> my, my voice is shaky and all. And, and he said, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he did, but I just think it was a sweet thing to say. He said, I bought that for you. And I thought, how sweet. So I'm standing there still dripping wet. Yeah. The cops weren't going to get me. I didn't know where Shelly was, but I'd figure it out some way. You know, it would work. So I'm just standing there. And if we had 10 or 15 minutes together, that was probably, that was my it, you know? So I thought, mother of God, if you're, cause he's going, he's heading right in the elevators, five, seven feet away from me. And he was just, you know, and the door opened and I had to say something. And I said, George, you know, I'm like, oh, God, did, did he hear me? You know, and he just he turned around. He did that the Liverpool, not yeah, but yeah, you know, that thing. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know how to talk, you know. So I said, I'm I'm sorry. And I, it gets me all emotional when I think about it, because he was just so kind and sweet. And boy, if they'd call my parents, my ass would have been grass. Woof. I don't even want to think about it. And poor, poor Shell, wherever. Oh, God. So anyway, when I said, you know, when when I would tell my friends that I would meet you. Oh, this is just so sweet. And I think he's not even here anymore. I said, when I said I was going to meet you, you know, and they, you know, one of those things and all that. But I, I was positive that. When I, when I finally met you, that it would be the most beautiful moment. It would be this, I couldn't find another word for it because that's what I always told everybody. It would, it would be a beautiful moment. And I'm looking right in this man's eyes and he's like four and a half feet away from me. And then after I say about it being a beautiful moment, he said two words to me and he said, it was and like and then um i'm on cloud nine all over again and then like you know because he he the elevator door started to close he held the elevator door three seconds you know probably i have no idea it seemed short and long to me all the same yeah. and he held it and he's just looking at me and I was just staring back at him. And then he let the door go. And he gave me one of those beetle bows for me. Only me, David. Just for you. Just for me. And you know what? When I saw the video from now and then, you know, at the end, where it's for that piece from A Hard Day's Night where they all bow. Yeah. I cried like a baby when I saw that because it took me right back, Straight back to 109 North Carolina Avenue. And that was the, that was it. And, and when when I said that it would be the most beautiful moment, he said, and it was. And then he went just like this. The elevator. What a gentleman. The nicest guy you could possibly imagine. Whatever he did with his crazy life, as a beetle, that's one thing. But in his heart and soul, he was that nice kid from Liverpool. His mom and dad raised him well. Oh yeah, he was a lovely man. I just, I was, I still get touched by that. My eyes are watering. <laughs> that was it's a wonderful thing, and and probably for Beatles fans, you actually got to meet the real George. I did not not Beatle George. You you, know, you met the Real George Harrison. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't woo, one of those things. I saw that nine times, you know, altogether. But when I saw that, and I'm certain it was one, how the situation looked, whatever reason he was down there, 
And the cop was just not nice to me. And I looked like 10 miles of bad road. And he probably just wanted to know what was going on. There was nobody. There was a couple people milling around. I don't know mm. who or what. I wasn't paying attention. But he just wanted to find out, what's up? Yeah. And it was really, I know I met George Harrison then. I know I did. The real and George. The real George. And when I got out, it was already daylight. It was already wow. daylight. And yeah. And, you know, I give him the name McGillicuddy a few times here and there, naturally. So anyway, isn't this awful? My eyes are still tearing. It was such, such a tender moment. God bless him. Anyway, I was looking for my girlfriend. So I still looked like I looked, right? So anyway, there's the cops that pull up, you know, who had heard, I guess, about the situation yeah. and all that stuff. And so um, it was, I heard, I heard George Harrison saved you from going in the paddy wagon. And then just, and Shell's coming right up on me and she heard it. I heard George Harrison saved you from going in the paddy wagon. There's a, there's a good entry for your diary. And I say, you can say that again. And she's like, Jude, Jude. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> she said, oh my God, looking at me, such a mess and everything. And she said, you met George Harrison? I said, I did. I did. She said, the first thing she said at that was looking like looking that. Like that. <laughs> and then I still had the Coke in my hand. And it was only like two, two and a half blocks up to the beach. And I'm telling her everything since I saw her last. And we're walking down the boardwalk together. And we shared the, we shared the Coke and all that. Now that sounds like something else. We shared the Coke together, right? Now it was Coca-Cola. Thank you. But yeah, call it soda. We know what you mean. We shared the soda. <laughs> and um, it. she was thrilled for me. She was different after that. I was forever different after that. Yeah. I was just, and then, you know, I told, I had to tell Pat. I certainly told Pat. I didn't want too many people to know because I, I didn't want it to really get back in my family. In fact, yeah. when I really told my mother, I swear this is true, I was probably 35 when I told her the whole story. And all my mother said to me was, I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> I said, if I'd known that, I would have told you 30 years ago. What? Right? But anyway, it was, and, and honestly, and then I thought, but I found out that they did every little thing, every little thing she does, she does for me. And I thought, well, that was kind of the way it was in the hotel that night for me. I did. It was perfect. It was, uh, it yeah. was beautiful. It, and I, you know, I wish he was alive for a lot of reasons. And if I never yeah. got to talk to him again, I, I would wish him to live to be over a hundred years old. That's my plan for me. Right. Still got stuff to, still got trouble to get into. Oh Yeah. <laughs> Of course, somehow, I guess, you know, but I, I would have loved to think that he would have remembered that. Oh, that, it, I think that's the kind of thing he would, because that would have stood out. It was only it like, if, if it was 15 minutes, we're lucky. And you know, just thinking that the way you're describing it, if you hadn't have looked the way you looked, sopping wet and everything maybe he wouldn't have stopped oh my god what an awful thought that is a thought isn't it maybe he yeah. just i was a mess well exactly I, and that knowing the real george harrison he would have thought hang on something's not right here and that's maybe is what got his attention yeah the first thing he said you know you want to know what was going on and then yeah when he said because of her bad taste in music God, you just what did you say to a beetle? What did you say? <laughs> but yeah. but the one thing when I said, and you know what I did, here's how I know what I did with my like as pertaining to my my body person. When I had the hanky and I had the soda, and I said, when I said, I always told all my friends, when I see be the most beautiful moment of my life and and what i really wanted to say and i was even too embarrassed to say it me of all people embarrassed to say anything right i wanted to say and look at me now i'm just an absolute mess but i didn't want to do that i just i didn't 
I didn't want to. So I couldn't for some reason. But when I said, and and I said it would be such a a beautiful moment. And and then and I'm looking at it and I went like this, like looking down at my mess. And it didn't matter to him whatsoever. No, no, not at all. He was just so helpful. And then when I said about it with the beautiful moment, he said, and it was, and then that bow, I thought, are you kidding? Who could write something like this? That's it. You, you could not invent your story. That's just it. You couldn't. Mm -mm. It was un yeah. it was unbelievably beautiful. And there's all little things I've forgotten in between, but I'm trying to get how many pages is that book? I don't know, 150. But it it was just so much fun. And when I said I wanted to feel like that, yeah. it, like I feel like that right now. I'm so touched by still. Yeah. I mean, I don't think especially who he was probably I would have been touched if it had been Joe, the janitor, really, you know, who helped me out of that mess. I, yeah, would, yeah. I would have been grateful, but who it was and that he could have just gone, Oh no, this is screwed up, man. I'm out of here afraid, you know, and he could, yeah. but he didn't. And no. it really was, it was like you said, that was, that was George Harrison. That wasn't the yeah. Beatles. He was but concerned it, for you. He was. Yeah. What a great guy, but I, well, it wasn't meant to be, but when I get to heaven, I'm going to say, how about that? Or maybe my son, John already has, guess what? You met my mom. You want to know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, the big question is, did you keep the handkerchief? I kept the hanky and the Coke bottle. I kept the hanky and the Coke bottle. I had it for years. Yeah. Wonderful. There was no no way that the, anything was going to happen. And I even had, um, I had, she said to me, you're not keeping those clothes right. I did keep the dress. There was no hope for the sandals or the, <laughs> the, the stockings. That was like, that. Yeah. but we, yeah, everything, everything just worked out beautifully. Every little thing. Every little thing. How weird is that? How weird is that? It just, yeah. everything just worked out. I mean, yeah. well, you know, but then years later, like I said, when somebody said to me, and this was at a Beatle Fest, you know, many moons ago. And it was, I never heard anything about anybody climbing up the back of the hotel, like saying I didn't do it. Right. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> really, it's like, that's okay. You know, that's all right. Whatever that's, I said. That's all up to them. And, and then it shows up, you know, in, in like, you know, I, I think it was around the 50th anniversary. And I thought, office, I didn't even know what the guy's name was. I didn't know they all had private bodyguards. I didn't even know that until like, what, 15, 10, 10 years ago or whatever yeah. it was. And then another thing that um, somebody said to me, here's, here's this. I mentioned the hookers and they wouldn't be so open about that. It wouldn't be like an open call. A lot of, lot of girls said that to me. I said, I'm just telling you, if you don't want to know, don't ask me because I can't tell you anything else. They were hookers there and they were showing a hard day's night. Why would they show a hard? I mean, just to, to you know, take something away, but you can't, that, here's another song, you can't take that away from me, right? You, know? you can't do that. You, you can't do, oh my God, there you go again. <laughs> Good for you. Should rely on this boy. <laughs> oh God, you're making me. You're making me. Laugh. <laughs> funny. This is too funny. You're so good at this stuff. I love you. <laughs> but then, then you know when I was validated, Larry Kane, who I met at a book festival in Collingswood, which is not far from where I live, and I got. To, I asked. Him, I said, "Can I introduce Larry Kane?" Well. I'm, I'm not sure if we have anybody chosen or anything yet. There might be. I said, well, it's me then. Can I do it? I said, because I said, I followed him while he followed the Beatles for the most part, whenever I could. And I would love to introduce him. Larry is shorter than I thought. I mean, I, well, I had boots on, but I don't think Larry's more than five, five or five, six. And he had, you know, shoes. And so anyway, I said to him, 
I'm getting to introduce you, Mr. Kane. He was a local Philadelphia news guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I said, I'm here to introduce you, Mr. Kane. It's nice to meet you. And I put my hand out. And he said, well, it's nice to meet you too. What's your name? I said, it's Judy. And he said, well, it's nice to meet you, Judy. I said, I just want to tell you one more thing. You know, when you were with the Beatles for their first American tour, he said, yes, I do. I said, well, you took my job. <laughs> right? He said, what? And I said, well, not really, but it was the one I wanted. He said, you went a million other <laughs> So anyway, I said, I've got, a, I've got a book to give to you. I said, come and see me later, right? You know, because I had the book was out then. So we talked and all that kind of stuff. But um, when, he was at, when he was at the one Beatle Fest where I was, where everybody was trying to say, you know, he, but he was talking about Atlantic City because a lot of stuff happened there. So then he told them about the hookers in Ah, and then I'm looking and there's like three of them that had I had seen earlier, you know, and had talked to them even before that. And he said, and we got to watch A Hard Day's Night. And I'm like, thank you. Right there it was. There it was. So that's what it that's what it took for validation. But I didn't need it because in my heart. Yeah. And I will just I will just never for he had he had like candy bar chocolate eyes. I had, you know, not to say take anything away from my wonderful children, grandchildren or great grandchildren, but it was absolutely, you know, what the Beatles in that time frame, even after they didn't tour. And, you know, it was heartbreaking because when I saw them, I saw them August 16th. My mother went with me. The last concert in Philadelphia was at JFK and uh, it was August 16th. It was like nine, eight or nine days before Candlestick. Had I known, you know, they were going to go, I think, to, I would have gone to Candlestick. Yeah. I mean, I would have found a way to go. I was, of course you would. The book that is behind you, A Date with a Beetle, is exactly the way it turned out in the weirdest kind of way possible. It wasn't a conventional date. It was a joke between me and the guys at work. When we used to leave work looking really nice and teenage dress and all that stuff. And the guys would say, got a date with a beetle, Jude? Oh, look at you looking good tonight. You got a date with a beetle? That's why the book became a date with a beetle. And little did I know when they were saying that to me that yeah. some magic would arise.